Melissa is a 15-year-old runaway. She has spent the last three years as a ward of the court. Now she's bracing for a tough hearing in front of Judge James Payne. Melissa became a chintz, a child in need of services, when her parents' drug addiction left them unable to take care of their kids. And we find out today that Melissa isn't just a teenager. She's also a mom. Her daughter Raven was born seven months earlier with severe brain damage. She has cerebral palsy, and as she gets older and keeps falling off the developmental chart, she's going to have more problems, there's going to be more therapy, whatever. Um, Patty Cavanaugh is the guardian ad litem for Melissa, serving as her representative in court. She's, she's a child herself, and I think she's realizing that now, and is in a difficult situation of trying to be a parent and a child. Um, but at the same time, um, she can't be on the run with this baby. And Melissa spent most of her pregnancy on the run, with no real place to call home. As her hearing begins in front of Judge Payne, we know Melissa remains a ward of the court, but now we learn Raven is also a child in need of services. Melissa has to listen as the hearing focuses on what should happen to her baby. Raven really needs a caretaker. Melissa's under 18 and she needs a caretaker too, and the foster mother will give everything she can for this baby, but she also needs Melissa's support, including making the most of herself, going back to school, though it's gonna be a very hard thing for her. And if Melissa doesn't make it, um, the baby the baby needs to stay with the foster parent. She just really needs to understand that this is crunch time. Melissa, anything you want to say? I understand. I don't care about you. Okay. My job right now on this case is to care about Raven. You've already shown that you don't particularly care in a variety of ways. But you see that young man over there with the glasses standing up? That's Sergeant Terheide. If you take off, I'll ask him to hunt you down and find you and bring you back here. You understand that? And if you happen to decide to leave with Raven, I'll have him and the FBI out looking for you. You will not interfere with the custody of Raven while I have control of her. It's Judge Payne's responsibility in this court hearing to focus solely on the case at hand, the Chins hearing for Raven, who has been in foster care since she was two weeks old. Raven's foster mom is Karen Butterworth. Karen is a married mother with seven children in her home, three biological children, two former foster children she's now adopted, and two medical needs foster babies, including Raven. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? Why is she willing to do that? Um, because she cares. Cares about what? Me and Raven. She primarily cares about Raven. Because Raven needs someone to care for. But I want you to understand what this is about. How old are you? You're 15, and I'm talking to you like you're 25. Raven is going to receive the care that she needs. I'd like that to be you. I'd like you to participate in that. I'd like you to understand what it is, because you are her mother. But if you can or won't do that, we will find someone who will. And then I'll handle you separately. Melissa has lived in a treatment facility that helps troubled kids since giving birth to Raven in June of 2000. Today, she's being released to the custody of her new foster mom. She'll finally be reunited with Raven. Karen says she's willing to take a chance on giving Melissa a home with her baby. Well, there's someone who cares for you, isn't it? How many people do you have like that? Just her. Not many, huh? You won't find many people. Don't blow this. Judge Payne admits it's a delicate balancing act when it comes to Melissa and Raven. He knows Melissa's life has not been easy, but the judge is firm with Melissa keeping the primary focus on Raven's well-being. Our responsibility is not to worry about the parent, even though the parent is 15, but to talk about this five-month-old, three-month-old child who, in that case, happens to have all sorts of problems because mother put herself at risk when she was pregnant, didn't get prenatal care, and now the child suffers for the rest of her life. I didn't find out I was pregnant until I was four months, but when I did find out I was pregnant, I hid it. Um, for a while, my dad was out of jail, but went back to prison. They were both on drugs, didn't care what I did. Um, we didn't even have the type of relationship where they even knew that I was pregnant. I hid it from them for till I was seven months pregnant. I didn't tell my, my dad went to jail, but my mom, she wasn't even around me enough to know that I was pregnant. Melissa has been in her new foster home exactly one week. Raven has been with this foster family since she was two weeks old. 
Raven's progress has been remarkable, considering her diagnosis at birth. She was 50% brain damaged. They didn't, they couldn't say for sure what her prognosis was, but it was not, it was not good. We've got a lot of education to do. We have um, lots of therapy to do. Um, and we are right now in a honeymoon phase. The experience will be that Melissa will go home, do okay for a period of time, but she will go back into an environment where she's not real comfortable. And she'll get tired of that. She'll leave, hopefully not with the child, in probably three to five months, if not sooner, and go back out on the streets, and then we'll go on with our situation with, with her child. But Melissa is optimistic. Even though she's not been to school since the sixth grade, she says she looks forward to heading back to the classroom for the first time in three years. She knows how she wants things to be in another month. I'd like to be in school. Um, hopefully things are going better with Raven. Um, I know when you, if you come back and see me in another month, things will be good. Um, as long as I'm around positive people and make positive decisions, I will be doing just fine. <laughs> Back in Indianapolis, the judge prepares for an initial hearing for four-day-old Asia Bell. Asia's mother, 28-year-old Vanessa, sits in front of the judge today without her newborn baby. In the matter of Asia Bell, will show the division of family. This case came to the courts and the child welfare system when Asia was born cocaine positive. Vanessa has tried to kick her drug habit for years. So far, rehab hasn't worked. So you've already been in rehab. Mm -hmm. Then why would you do it again? Vanessa now has to admit that her daughter is a child in need of services. There's been filed in this case a petition alleging that uh, Asia chi is a child in need of services. Have you received a copy of that petition? Uh, yeah. Do you have a chance to go through that? Yeah. Mother's looking at you again. At Vanessa's side is her mother, who is concerned about the fate of her four-day-old granddaughter. Vivian Bell recognizes Asia is a cocaine baby, but she's determined to support Vanessa and get the baby back. If she did all the things that the court would fire her to do, would there be any chance at all of her getting the baby back? Well, there's a chance, yeah. Sure, it's not our job to take children from parents, but to make sure children are safe and protected. And as you sit in court and watch this, it's amazing how not just the parents focus on the reasons why they're not doing things, but everyone else does too. And no one says, literally, no one says, hey, these kids are important, we don't care about you. After court, Vanessa and her mom talk about Vanessa's addiction. A cocaine habit so intense, even at nine months pregnant, Vanessa still could not stay away from the drug. Because she went out two days before she was born and mm. fell. <laughs> I'm not a drug user. I never have even attempted. Don't want to, but I know for a fact that it is some powerful stuff. And it seems to make your mind just make you feel like you crazy. Don't care. You, you just you just don't care. The focus for a number of years has been parents and parents rights to kids and, and and what parents are doing or not doing and forgetting about the kids that these kids are sitting in limbo waiting for that person who is responsible for them to be responsible. Mm -hmm. and, and it's tough to get the system away from that. Thirty days after we first meet Vanessa, we're back in court again. But this time, the stakes are much higher. Baby Asia has now been in foster care for over a month. This morning is another Chin's hearing, but unlike her first court appearance, today Vanessa is on trial. Child welfare case manager Nancy Brown is about to give some damaging Grace testimony. Wright, you swear or affirm the evidence you're about to give in this cause will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be gone. At that time, did Vanessa Bell admit to using cocaine during her pregnancy with Asia? Yes. Okay. Did she admit to using up to a week before the delivery of her child? She admitted using it a week before uh -huh. the child. Yes. And did she admit to having a substance abuse addiction? Yes. All right. Is there a parent currently, uh, Ms. Brown, who's capable of caring for or appropriately parenting Asia Bell? Not in my opinion, no. Okay. Case manager Brown says Vanessa has three daughters and a son who are in the legal custody of Vanessa's mother. 
Vanessa's parental rights were terminated to a fifth child, who was also born cocaine positive. Would you raise your right hand? But it's now Vanessa's turn to testify. As she takes the stand, the future of her baby girl rests with Judge Payne. Um, I don't know if it matters or not, but I've been going to, um, I've been seeing her every Monday. I've been going to my meetings. I've been clean now for 42 days. Um, whatever I have to do to get my baby back, I will. And that's all. Okay, anything further you want to say? Um, no. I'm trying really hard. Did you want her to say something else, ma'am? I didn't want to just emphasize on so much as getting that baby back. I want to emphasize on the whole process of herself staying clean and being a mother and getting her babies back, her baby back. I mean, I just don't want to pimp, make it look like she's just doing it to get the baby back. I want to do it for herself. You know, self-preservation first. If she preserve herself, then everything else will fall in place. Anything else? That's it. At stake is whether or not Asia will get to leave foster care and go home. But if Judge Payne declares that Asia is a chins, a child in need of services, Vanessa won't be getting her baby back anytime soon. She listens nervously as Judge Payne makes his decision. Uh, the court will find, since Indiana law requires that even a reporting of a trace amount of a legend drug or a uh, controlled substance is sufficient for the finding of a child in need of services with the record submitted, court will find that Vanessa, uh, as to Vanessa Bell, Asia Bell is a child in need of services. She's a good girl. She has a heart of gold, but she just fell through that crack. I just couldn't get out. We've had fights and arguments, and, but that, you know, I still love her and I want her to do right and I want her to be a mother to her children like I was a mother to her. But bringing Asia home won't be easy. That will depend on Vanessa's fight to stay clean. And ultimately, what Judge Payne decides is in the baby's best interest. I just take it one day at a time. It depends on how bad you really want it. If you really want to be sober, stay clean, you can do it. But it's not easy. Like Vanessa and baby Asia, every once in a while in the child welfare and juvenile justice system, you meet an exceptional child who seems to defy all the odds. Right, so Such is the case with well, Delina. At 17, Delina has been a ward of the court teacher. ever since she can remember. Well, I've always been so independent my whole life um, because well, I've been actually in the system for almost 11 and a half years. Um, I was taken away from my mom whenever I was four and in a foster home until I was 12. And I was in about 15, 20 different foster homes and, you know, um, I just, I grew up by myself, I had to. Go on the record, please, in the matter of Delina Hodges. Delina comes to court this winter morning for a regularly scheduled review hearing for herself and her son, Gavin. Both mother and son remain wards of the court and in the same foster home. that you remain a ward and in your present placement. Do you agree? Judge Talaferro is especially open with Delina in court. She sees the remarkable determination of this teenage mom. Right. So how's the baby? He's great. He is so smart. He's two and a half, and I actually have a picture. Oh, I'd love to see it. Okay. Thank you for bringing that. I don't think I've, I did see him once, but he was he just a, a baby. Oh my, how old is he now? As far as Chin's hearings go, Delina seems to be an example of just how resilient kids can be. Delina and her son have been with foster mom, Kathy Brown, for almost three years. Annie, you've done very well in foster care. There's not been one problem since you've been placed in foster care. Not one. Thank you for bringing the picture. What a healthy child. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Take care of yourself. See you in about six months. <laughs> well, she's done such a great job. She really has. I'm so proud of her. Outside the judge's doors, Delina talks about Gavin's father. Two weeks after um, I got, he left me, which will be Valentine's Day of 98, he went and got with my friend, and now she had a baby. And she was also 14. 
and he's 22. My mom did let him stay the night with me, which, I mean, if I have a daughter at 14 years old, she's not bringing a 20-year-old man in my house and stay the night with him. In fact, she better not even have a 20-year-old boyfriend. <laughs> Gavin's father is currently serving time for the statutory rape of Delina's friend. Teenage mothers generally face the future alone. Nearly 80% of the fathers of children born to teenage mothers never marry mom and pay on average just $800 a year in child support. That's a scary proposition for a young person to face adulthood as a single parent uh, without, with limited education, with limited job skills. I don't know how the, some of the young people survive. I blame my mom for the things that she's done to me. Um, like my mom kicked me out of my house whenever I was pregnant. Finally, they put me with my foster mom that I have now and she is wonderful. I've been there since my son was three months old and I probably won't leave until I'm like 20, <laughs> something like that. Foster mom Kathy Brown has been a big influence in Delina's life. Delina has been in dozens of foster homes since she was a toddler. But this is a house she calls a home. Delina and Gavin moved in when Delina was 15 and Gavin was just three months old. Kathy admits that it's tough to think about the day the two of them will move out. The longer they stay with me, the greater our bond is. And um, one of the things Delina does really well, or tries to do really well, is think about what's best for Gavin. She can't always make her decisions based on that, but she tries. And I think she probably believes that it's good for Gavin to continue to see me, and, and I think that it's good for her to see me. Dr. Mina Dokun is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and believes lack of stability is a huge problem for kids in the system. Child welfare or child protection systems often compound the results of the abuse because they take the child out and they put them here and then here and then here and then here. And it's not at all uncommon for us to see children who've been in five or six foster homes by the time they're six. And, you know, it's very, very difficult uh, to help children when they've had so much lack of stability. So dancing at the party. You went dancing at the party. <laughs> but do kids like Delina, who seemingly break the cycle, ever fully escape? The odds are against her, but Delina's determined to make it. She primarily cares about Raven. When we first met 15-year-old Melissa, she was planning for the future for herself and her infant daughter, Raven. I would like to be in school, doing a good job. I know when you, if you come back and see me another month, things will be good. And true to her word, a month after our first visit, Melissa is adapting to her new high school. Child up. welfare case okay. manager Gretchen Gentry is at Melissa's foster home today to check on Melissa's progress. This is my first time since the incident, so yeah, I will. Melissa is also learning to take care of her baby. This includes administering seizure medication to Raven. Today will be the first time Melissa does it herself. It is care fate. And how many times a day does she take him? Go look at her chart. I know she takes it six, 10, two, and six. Yep, milliliter. Milliliter. Yep. So would it be right there? Uh-uh, uh-uh. You want me to do the other two while you pull up the tiger talk? I forgot how much she takes of it. Can we put 2.5 mils in it? Right there. Just shake it. The top of the black line, because if you put them upside down, Don't they'll try. leak out. Melissa knows this current shared foster placement for her and her daughter Raven is as close as she'll come to a family at this stage in her life. She misses her brother, who is in a separate foster home, and her sister, who is currently a runaway. Melissa says she still loves her parents, but doesn't let herself think about being with her mom and dad anymore. When I ran away, I was around my mom and my dad, and I seen that they didn't want to make no changes in their life. They um, wanted to keep doing what they wanted to do, and don't want to take care of the kids, don't want to try, so I gave up on that. I do. Melissa has been out of her home and awarded the court over 15 months. Today, by law, the state must file a termination of parental rights petition against Melissa's parents. The termination is not automatic, but unless there's a compelling reason to drop it, the hearing to completely sever all parental rights will be finalized anywhere from 90 days to one year. Melissa's parents declined to talk on camera, but say they are remorseful 
that their family has been torn apart. Chin up. Sure you're okay? Okay. Cause number 2000 JC704 in the matter of Raven. In Kevin less than a week's time, Melissa returns to Judge Don't Payne's worry. court for a review on her daughter Raven's case. It's just five days later, but the situation between Melissa and her foster mom takes a drastic turn. After months of living under the same roof, molding as a family, raising Raven together and turning her life around, it seems Melissa has started to feel the pull of her old friends and family. Things are beginning to unravel. Um, she refuses to be accountable and she refuses to be honest about her actions. Anything else I need to know? No, that would be it. Well, let's say anything you want to say. I thought I was pretty direct with you last time. It was. Some of our kids start to do real well and then figure they don't deserve it. Or they don't like it. Or it's not as much fun as it was on the street. Are you there? Is that what you've decided? No. Well, you've got two worlds. The one you're living in right now and the one you used to live in. You cannot have both. Which one do you want? I want the one I have now. Then you're going to have to give up on the other one. Your grades, how are they? They're good. No, they're not. They're great. Yeah. Okay, so you're doing everything right, except you're tr starting to get back to where you used to be. My job is the accountability arm. I will hold you accountable, Melissa. Chicago's Cook County Public Guardian, Patrick Murphy, knows how hard it is for kids to break the bond with old friends and family. But he says there comes a point when the state must terminate a parent's rights if it's in the child's best interest. Our government and all governments have traditionally deferred to the family and said, how you raise your children within certain limits is up to you. At some point, I think we have to start taking that line and making it a little firmer because we defer too often to a lot of people who are doing a horrible job of raising their kids. At what point does the state step in? And at what point does the state say, I'm sorry, you're doing a terrible job, we're going to take them away. But once we do that then, we have to provide the professional resources for these kids. The Adoption of and Save Families Act, we um, have got some now guidelines that we have to move children through the system somewhat faster than we ever did before, uh, which has really you know, helped because it, it makes caseworkers put their feet to the fire and do their jobs a little faster than they otherwise would have. It makes court schedule cases. Every, we hear cases now every three and six months for review, where in the past you reviewed matters every year, sometimes 18 months. No matter how tough things get, Melissa says she's determined to carve the right path for herself you ready? and Raven. Want to take your medicine, honey? I know when I spoke to Melissa, her goals were uh, a week and a month at a time, and we're looking at years at a time. Nationally, so. fewer than one-third of teenage mothers finish high school. Yet after being away from school for three years, Melissa is earning straight A's. Her confidence is intact, and she says she's looking forward to her next hearing on May 24th. I know what changes I have to make and I can do it. The last time we saw 15-year-old Melissa, we she was struggling with the lure of her old friends and this? feeling trapped in a life of perpetual foster care. But after Ow. thinking about how far she had come and the future she wanted for herself and her baby Raven, Melissa seemed back on track. I know for sure things will be better. I know what changes I have to make, and I can do it. After all the hard work, all the positive signs, and her repeated apparent good intentions, the next chapter in Melissa's story is a stunning one that makes local headline news. This missing teen and mother is a ward of the court along with her infant daughter. Exactly 29 days after telling us she could make it, Melissa crawled through her bedroom window, stole her foster parents' car, and ran away with 11-month-old Raven. She and her child were in the foster home, and she took off. So Judge Payne makes an urgent early morning phone call to the county director of the Division of Family and Children. The judge is on a mission to find Melissa and Raven. There's a detective in, I think it is Johnson County, Amanda Kees, Kiesling, who has put out a nationwide bulletin 
for her. And remember Sergeant Terheide, the face Judge Payne told Melissa to take a hard look at when we first met her four months earlier? That's Sergeant Terheide. If you take off, I'll ask him to hunt you down and find you and bring you back here. That same Sergeant Terheide is now officially in charge of finding Melissa and checking in by phone. Yeah, I'll call the uh, Hendricks County uh, deputy and see if she has anything first. Across town, after foster mom Karen Butterworth wakes up to the realization that Melissa and Raven are gone, she is in shock. So she's going to be so stupid. I was so stupid. Because Matt's keys were missing yesterday off Kara's key ring, and I had a thought, and I didn't go with it. I thought, check Melissa's room. And I thought, well, no, because this trust thing, and she got me. I was stupid. You will not interfere with the custody of Raven while I have Judge control. Payne is no stranger to cases Raven's like Melissa's. Right Melissa knows Raven the streets well. Court, she spent nearly five months on the run when she was pregnant with Raven. The United States has the highest teen pregnancy rate of any developed nation. Problems related to teen pregnancy cost taxpayers $7 billion a year. So for juvenile judges like Judge Payne, this Saturday morning crisis is no surprise. It, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's our kids, and um, adults typically indicate what children should do, and they do it. They, they teach the behavior, and kids model it, and then we blame kids for the problems. This is, this is predictable. It's now been two days since Melissa ran away with Raven. The longer they're gone, the worse the odds are that they'll be found. But local TV stations are turning up the heat, and for Melissa, hiding forever won't be easy. When we first met Vanessa over 30 days ago in Judge Payne's court, the fate of her baby, Asia, was still hanging in the balance. Asia was born cocaine positive, declared a ward of the court, and placed in foster care. It's now a month later. Today, Vanessa and her four children arrive at a family and child visitation facility called Giant Steps. This is the only place where Vanessa is allowed to visit her baby. Vanessa gets to see Asia every Monday for one hour. Dang, she got cuter. <laughs> Say hello. Can I hold her, Mama? So let me hold her for a minute. Ronnie Taylor is vice president and CEO of Giant Steps and is supervising today's visit. We don't go in a row. <laughs> Families are required to see their children at least once a week by a state statute until they lose the rights of the children, if they do lose the rights. So a lot of times if families don't participate, they lose rights to their kids. Cocaine use among pregnant women is especially tough to deal with, according to Dr. Tacoma McKnight, professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Northwestern University Medical School. Cocaine, I think, scared all of us in, in the field of obstetrics. It's just a very highly addictive type of a drug. So women have a very difficult time in kicking the habit um, during their pregnancies. It, it just really is that way. Okay, you guys have about five more minutes. Girls, start cleaning up the toys. Vanessa's one hour weekly visit with Asia is over. <laughs> Vanessa is not the only one who hates to see the time end. Leaving their baby sister is especially hard for nine-year-old Calvin and six-year-old Vivian. Now my gut feeling is that it's going to turn out great, but at the same time, you never know because with a drug problem, it's really hard to predict because one difficult life situation can drop a person off the wagon, and you never know, you know, just one bad day could change everything, so it's hard to say at this point. Parties in the matter of Asia Bell. Please report to courtroom four. Vanessa Asia returns Bell. for her third court visit today, where she'll learn what the state and the court have planned for Anything Asia's further. future. No, Your Honor. Um, I'm sure that we're here for a disposition. Judge Payne uh, listens to testimony from Catherine Brown, attorney for the Division of Family and Children. Uh, Vanessa knows she won't have many more chances. This is it. Perhaps her final shot at getting her daughter well. back. I've been doing everything I'm supposed to do. I know I've been wrong. I've done wrong in my past. And it's getting better. It's going to get better. The hearing is long. But at the last minute, Vanessa gets some positive news. 
Judge Payne decides he's going to continue to review her case. He gives her the chance to remain in counseling and work toward getting Asia back. But if one time you don't do something, if you miss a class, they will have the right to come back in here and say, we're through, we want to move on with Asia going to someone else to live forever. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. In other words, your ability to get Asia is going to be real tough, isn't it? Yeah. You can't make a mistake. He's working with me. A lot of judges wouldn't do that. He's giving me a chance to get my child back. Since we met her almost five months earlier, Vanessa has made an obvious transformation in her appearance, in her mental attitude, in her determination. I see friends that still use every day, like when I go to the store and stuff like that, and they, Vanessa, why you look good? And you know, I always hear, I get compliments all the time. When we visit her at home where she lives with her kids, her mom and dad and her extended family, we get an even better picture of how she's been able to come this far. The love and support of her family who refused to let cocaine destroy Vanessa's life. By me being on drugs, it wasn't the atmosphere or from the family I was I come from. It was my choice. I'm not from a bad background, you know. I don't have a bad background. I just it was my choice and it was a ugly choice. After nearly five months, Vanessa is still clean. She helps around the house by babysitting. <laughs> Vanessa doesn't have Asia back yet, but she's meeting every milestone required by the courts, made every court appearance never missed a visit with Asia, and continues on her quest for a life free of drugs. She knows she can't make one mistake. If she does, baby Asia will almost certainly be placed for adoption. With the help of her family, Vanessa is making it one step at a time. Uh, it's more like a hope thing right now. I just, I just hope it. I pray every night, pray every day. Six months ago, when we first met Delina, she told us her remarkable story. Over 20 foster homes, 11 different schools, having a baby at 14, and then at age 16, waging her own successful fight to terminate her biological mother's parental rights over her. Now at age 17, Delina has been in the child welfare system for most of her life. For Monroe Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro, Delina's case represents that special something that helps keep her going through all the difficult times on the bench. Well, she's done such a great job. She really has. I'm so proud of her. But shortly after the heartwarming court hearing where she shows Judge Talaferro pictures of her son Gavin, her situation takes a turn for the worse. As her 18th birthday approaches, Delina forges two checks from her foster mom, then runs away from home. I don't know why I did it, and I didn't need the money. I had no reason to do it, but I did. After a week on the run without her little boy, Delina couldn't take it anymore so called and called her home-based counselor. I said, I can't do this anymore. I need to see him. I took myself to the youth shelter, and then I lost him, and I haven't seen him. I didn't get to see him for weeks, for weeks, and that was just, <laughs> and then the first time I saw him, the first thing he said to me was, Mommy, are you sad? Oh. Now Delina is allowed to see her son twice a week. Delina is in a new foster home as she awaits her trial. Because she's a flight risk, Delina's time with Gavin is supervised by social worker Becky Rose. Gavin still lives with foster mom, Kathy Brown. Delina knows there's always the chance she could lose her son for good if she takes another wrong turn. Hello. It's a tense summer morning when Delina arrives at the courthouse for her initial delinquency hearing. This is the same hallway where six months ago, Delina told us she would probably live with foster mom, Kathy Brown, until she was 20. And she's wonderful. I've been there since my son was three months old and I probably won't leave until I'm like, <laughs> 20, <laughs> something like that. Today, Kathy and Delina don't even look at each other. It's not the check forging or running away that stuns Kathy. She says the most painful realization is that Delina wants to live somewhere else. We've repaired so many damages over the last two and a half years. And then the idea that she's not willing to repair and, and rebuild the relationship so that she and Gavin and I could be together just breaks my heart. <laughs>
Just a few feet away, Delina nervously waits for her court hearing. She says she never thought she'd be in this much trouble when she forged the checks and ran away. Now I'm sitting here and I'm wondering whether or not I'm going to go to prison or not. Delena, you are charged with three uh, delinquent acts. Count one, theft. Count two, theft. Count three, forgery. It's surprising, but we shouldn't be so surprised because, after all, it has to be frightening for a young person almost 18 years of age uh, without a solid family, without family support, the things that many of us take for granted. Uh, does that excuse her behavior? No. But at least it, it gives us a glimpse of the problems that she's having. Delina is relieved to learn that today's hearing is mostly formality. This is but in 30 days, Delena she will face the biggest Mary challenge of her life, for initial her trial. On a petition alleging delinquency. When we last left 15-year-old Melissa, she'd run away in the middle of the night with her 11-month-old daughter, Raven. Nationwide bulletin Judge Payne and a police detective were scouring the city for signs of Melissa and her baby. Run. That was so stupid. Foster mom, Karen Butterworth, also had local TV stations reporting the story. Less than a week after she ran away, the Butterworths get the call they've been waiting for. Melissa, with Raven, finally turns herself in to local police. It's now time to pick up Raven at a local hospital where yeah. she'd been taken for observation. I, I have to wonder what all she's been through from all the places I hear that, uh, you know, two o'clock in the morning getting up and moving somewhere. I just, you know, it's... It... While Karen is reunited with Raven, she knows Melissa sits in a jail cell waiting to find out the consequences of her actions. In just two days, Melissa will have to return to court. I think she'll be very remorseful and very emotional and, um, I think she'll be scared to death. By the time we see Melissa one last time, it's three months later, and she's in juvenile court facing charges of auto theft and neglect. Are you asking at this time that I accept this plea agreement and your admission to count one the petition of auto theft? Yes, sir. You understand that by After striking a plea agreement, the state of Indiana decides to drop Melissa's neglect charges in exchange for her guilty plea to auto theft. Until her final disposition or sentencing hearing, Melissa will remain locked up in the Marion County Juvenile Detention Facility. What Melissa needs is to understand that she is not a responsible human being yet. She's 15 years old. If she can learn to be dependent at this point on the right person, she has a chance. Those were Judge Payne's words six months earlier now, this Chen's child, this child in need of services, is also a juvenile delinquent. Still, we couldn't help but remember Melissa the way we saw her so many times over the last six months. Her mind made up that she was going to make it as a teenager, as a student, as a mom. If you come back and see me another month, things will be good. Um, uh, I just know they'll be good. Um, I have my mind set for what I want to do, so um, as long as I'm around positive people and make positive decisions, I will be doing just fine. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chalfant, does Delena It was 30 days ago that 17-year-old Delina sat in front of Circuit Court Judge Viola Talaferro after being today. charged with two There's delinquent acts of theft and forgery. Under it's now a month later, and on this warm, overcast morning in Bloomington, Indiana, today record, is Delina's trial. That there will be an admission today. After 13 years in the child welfare system, no one involved in Delina's case ever thought they'd see a day like today. As to the allegations you committed the crime of forgery, what exactly did you do? I wrote two checks and signed Kathy's name. And you intended to commit the crime of forgery when you did that? Yes. Delina is on trial for forging two checks totaling almost $400 from her foster mom of three years, Kathy Brown. Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Brett Raper tries to understand why a model foster child like Delina would steal from a foster mother she says she loves. What were you going to do with the money uh, that you received from these items? I was going to give it to a person that I liked that wanted it. 
things don't get any better for Delina, as her probation officer, Pam Kane, is called to the witness stand. What was recommended at the detention hearing was that she not go to detention because she was going to go to school and maintain employment. Um, the very next day I found out that she was not going to work and that she skipped school the next day after that detention hearing. Um, since that time, I believe she's also tested positive on a drug screen. Next, Delina's child welfare case manager, Michelle Fields, takes the stand. Delina knows with each round of testimony, Judge Talaferro is forming a decision on what should happen to her. Uh, one of the recommendations is that Delina go to secure detention uh, today uh, for five days of the 30 possible days. Any concerns about that? I don't think she understands that if she were an adult, five days would be a miracle. In addition, she has a child that this is affecting. Delina's case manager does point out, however, that Delina spent years in the system playing by the rules, gaining the admiration of nearly everyone at the Monroe County Office of Family and Children. She was considered the star child, you know, one of the kids on our caseload that you talk highly about, that you say, I wish I had more kids like Delina. As nervous as Delina is about the testimony from her case manager and probation officer, nothing prepares her for the last person to take the stand. Former foster mom Kathy Brown, who still has custody of Delina's three-year-old son. I agree with the recommendations. Delina said to me, Kathy, I never meant to hurt you. I didn't think you'd find out. This did hurt you very much, though, doesn't it? it, it it's been devastating. I told Delina in the first time we ever met when she said, I just want a place to live where I'm wanted. I want to be part of a family. I said, that's what I want. I want a, a family. I wanted to be Delina's mother and Gavin's grandmother. I've been saving for her college. I didn't know what else to do when I found out she forged the checks. Then to, to press criminal charges. It's similar to what happened last summer when she took my Mac card and took $300 out. And when um, she, when I confronted her with it, she denied it. And then when she realized I was going to watch a videotape of the transaction, she admitted to, to doing it. I, I want her to accept some responsibility. Delina, could you look at me? For what she's done to me and from her own heart make some amends, as opposed to people telling her what she has to do. With Kathy Brown and her childhood friends looking this on, Delina can barely fight through her words as she makes one last attempt say, to convince the judge that she should I not be sent to secure detention. I just want everyone to know that's been involved in my case and that I know that I have been a disappointment and that I am very angry at myself <laughs> and that I want to be a good person and I want to do good things <laughs> and I want to succeed <laughs> and I don't want to go through the court system like this. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> so I, I just do want everybody to know that regardless of if you don't think that I and remorseful. I am, and I am truly sorry. After almost an hour in the courtroom, it's now up to Judge Talaferro, not a jury, to decide Delina's fate. There's been a lot of discussion by almost everyone about whether or not uh, Delina should go to detention, as if that is the only issue in front of this court. That's not the only issue. First of all, the most important thing is what are the appropriate consequences for a young person who commits theft and forgery? Is Delena a bad person? I don't think so. Is her behavior unacceptable? Of course. So what is appropriate will be four months of formal probation, 
30 days in a secure detention facility, participation in the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, and monetary restitution to be paid in full to Kathy Brown, complete the Youth Education Shoplifting Program in order to understand the effects of stealing, complete the brief intensive group at the Center for Behavioral Health to address Delena's substance abuse issues, 40 hours of public restitution. Now, I have not said exactly what the recommendations are. I am going to send you to detention today for five days, and I will suspend the 25 days. So you will go now with Miss Kane out of this room, out of this door. And Delena, I wish that I could have seen you walk out of the door leading to the outside. She wasn't here for all of the good she'd done in the past. She was here because she committed two offenses. Stop. Hi, Pam Kane, probation. Need to go from three to two, please. This is what I deserve. I don't want to go, but this is what I have to do. Her future's in her hands. I do not know what that will be. And can I have holding on second floor? <laughs> 